Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our Faculty of Math Fall Open House virtual session today. Uh, it's great to see the participant number climbing this morning. Uh, we're just going to give everyone a couple minutes um, to log in and to get settled, and then and then we'll start in about one or two minutes. Okay, I think we'll begin there. It's 8.30 in the morning on the nose here in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Uh, so welcome to the fall open house session on admissions to the Faculty of Mathematics. It's great to see so many participants on the call. My name is Meg McClellan and I'm the Director of Undergrad Recruitment and International here for the Faculty of Math. I'm excited to be on the call with you this morning and I'm also excited uh, for our presenter to today, Dr. Troy Vesiga, who is the Associate Dean for Undergrad Admissions and Outreach Department. Uh, welcome, Troy. Thank you for presenting this information to all the prospective students and applicants and maybe parents and supporters on the call today. Why don't you take some time and tell the attendees a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, and, and maybe your connection to Waterloo? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, as Meg said, my name is Troy Vesiga. I'm a lecturer in the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science, so part of my job is to teach computer science courses, and in fact, I'm teaching the first year computer science course this term to the incoming class. Um, I have three degrees from the University of Waterloo, so I have three for three in terms of those undergrad degrees. Um, I am the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Admissions, so I make admissions decisions and scholarship decisions, and I talk about math programs and computer science programs to students around the country and around the world to encourage them to think about applying to Waterloo. I'm also involved in some of the math and computing competitions. Uh, in particular, I'm in charge of the Canadian Computing Competition and the coach of the university-level ICPC team, so I look forward to talking to you today. That's great. Thanks, Troy. You really are the right person to be sharing this information uh, this morning. Um, before I let Troy begin, there are a few housekeeping items that I just thought I would mention uh, to the participants on the call today. Um, there's quite a bit of programming going on this week virtually leading up to our first uh, in-person fall open house in a couple of years. Um, so I would encourage you to, to join those virtual sessions, learn what life can be like for students at Waterloo. Um, the fact that you're here learning about what uh, a math and CS student life is like is, is fantastic today. Troy is going to go over, we have about an hour together, Troy is going to go over uh, the importance of studying math and computer science, why our faculty is unique, and maybe what makes us different from other universities that you might be looking at, um, and maybe most importantly why everyone's on the call today, how to successfully apply to our faculty. So we'll go through some application tips and uh, tricks this morning. So there's lots to learn today. And hopefully Troy and I will actually have some time uh, to answer some frequently asked questions verbally uh, at the end of his presentation today. Uh, but you should also know that there's a team of people working behind the scenes, answering your questions, uh, in the Q&A tab. So it's important that you don't put your questions in the chat, but you put your questions in the Q&A tab, and then that way uh, we can answer your questions and send you all the appropriate links uh, through that Q&A tab. Okay, so that's it for me. Troy, I will uh, I will get out of the way and, and I'll send it over to you. Great, thanks, Mike. So 
I'll be talking about admissions for fall 2023. If you are not in grade 12 or the equivalent yet, um, this information will still be relevant to you and you can plan what you should be doing in your grade 12 year. But mostly I'll be talking about what we believe is going to be true for fall 23 admissions. There's me uh, looking slightly less hairy and possibly younger. Um, so as mentioned, I'm the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Admission and Outreach. I make admissions decisions, scholarship decisions, and oversee the both the admissions and the outreach side for the faculty of mathematics. I am one of multiple associate deans. So the faculty is structured and there is one dean, uh, Mark Giesbrecht, and then there are a few associate deans, one in charge of grad programs, one in charge of research, one in charge of computing, uh, one in charge of undergrad studies. So we have a few associate deans and we all work together in various portfolios to help support the activities of the faculty. So perhaps you are waffling whether or not you want to actually study mathematics and computer science. So let me help you unwaffle. If you're thinking about mathematics, computational, or statistical sciences, you should think about doing one or all three of those if two things are true. If you're good at it and you enjoy it. So if, if neither of those things or only one of those things is are true, then you should think about doing something else. That is, if you don't like math or computer science or statistics, you certainly certainly shouldn't do it. Go do something else that you do enjoy. And ideally, you're also good at it. That is, you know, you can solve hard problems and you like to be challenged. And in fact, kind of that leads to the second set of bullets on this slide. I hope you find mathematics somewhat challenging, but the, you overcome those challenges. That is the enjoyable part, at least for me, is actually solving a hard problem and say, oh, I figured that out, or I got that answer, I wrote that program, or I determined that the solution to that equation. If that kind of gets you going and makes you excited, that is a good reason to think about doing math. If you like looking at problems analytically and trying to reduce it down and simplify and figure out what's the crucial part of it, that's another reason to think about mathematics. Mathematics at Waterloo does blend theory and practice. You are going to graduate, if you finish the undergrad program, with a solid foundation in the theory of math, computer science, and statistics. But you'll also know that those that theory informs how we actually solve real problems in the real world. And I'll talk a little bit later about what those kind of practical problems are that we are solving. So why should you study? Well, one reason is that there are there's math and computers everywhere. Every bit of data in the world is modeled, analyzed, used for prediction, quantified, measured, stored on a computer, and processed somehow. And those are all mathematical or computational or statistical things. That is, businesses, companies, organizations, governments want to know about how to process data in reasonable ways. And so the number of jobs that will require these skills is large and growing. And the nice thing about mathematics, computer science, is that once you've solved a problem, invariably, well, someone will say, well, actually, what if we added this twist to the problem? So problems are solved, but then the problems themselves change and you need a different solution. You need to change your solution that you had before in some new and interesting way. So the jobs that you get in mathematics or computer science or statistics are interesting, dynamic, and really are important for advancing civilization. So let me tell you a little bit about math, computer science, and Waterloo. We are the only dedicated faculty of mathematics in North America. At most universities, mathematics is probably a department, possibly in the science faculty. Um, sometimes computer science is in the engineering faculty. Sometimes statistics is in the arts faculties. So things are kind of scattered around campus. And usually they are much smaller. One thing about Waterloo's math program, as you can see from the information on the top right there, is that we have over 8,000 grad and undergrad students, over 240 full-time professors, and over 500 courses in math, stats, and computer science. And so that breadth and depth really changes fundamentally how math is viewed in Waterloo. Other institutions do not have that same size, of undergrad program in terms of students, professors, or courses. So your choices are much more limited at other institutions. 
Waterloo has been ranked consistently as the top one in inside the top 50 in the world for both mathematics and computer science. In fact, in the most recent, in the last couple months, computer science has been, the computer science of Waterloo has been ranked as the best computer science program in the country. And one key fundamental reason why is because we have this very positive kind of feedback loop where we are, we have good programs and we attract good students, which causes us to have good programs. So really it's the undergrad population that makes our programs really outstanding. So I would say the students that come to Waterloo are some of the brightest and best and keenest and most energetic students in the country in terms of computer science or mathematics or statistics. They want to do math and learn and expand the field and use it for good. That is, they want to somehow solve real problems. Now, of course, outside the classroom, there's lots of things that you can do. There's lots of extracurricular activities. We are a huge institution. So there's hundreds of clubs, sports teams, and intramurals, and other activities, and, and groups and organizations that you can join and be part of, public lectures, other classes, tons of opportunity to kind of grow. And our students are involved in a variety of things. Uh, the set of students I uh, have here on this picture with this same associate dean, uh, as I mentioned, one of the jobs or one of the activities, it's not really a job, it is part of my job is to coach the ICPC team, which is the International Collegiate Programming Contest team. And this is the team that represented Waterloo at the North American Championship. Uh, recently, we finished sixth overall um, in North America, and maybe fourth overall. Uh, and so this team shown here is going to the world finals next year. Uh, and in fact, in three days, I will be flying with a previous world finals team going to Bangladesh uh, as we compete about uh, compete against the about 120 of the other top universities in the world, like MIT, like Tsinghua, um, like Moscow State University. So part of the opportunities you have here is to kind of interact with these really top students. What does the faculty of math look like structurally? Well, we have four strong departments and one strong school. And I'm gonna talk about those in a little bit. As mentioned previously, we have over 240 full-time professors. There are faculties in this country that, that are smaller than this. And this is just math faculty members. Um, we have four different undergrad degrees and a ton of different programs, options, and specializations. And I'm gonna give you just a very high level view of these. Many of our students continue on in grad study, so we have a large grad program in all of the areas that I'll talk about. And so even if you don't come to Waterloo for your undergrad, do keep us in mind for your grad programs if you're interested in doing a master's or a PhD. And those professors that are teaching here are very active researchers and are at the cutting edge of the research in their particular fields. One really nice aspect about the math programs as well is that we have a common first year. So everybody in the first year is taking the same set of courses. That is, they will take a calculus course, an algebra course, a computer science course, communications course, and one other elective. And so that core, those math and computer science core courses, everybody, whether or not you're a math student or a CS student or an uh, incoming data science student or any of those students are all taking the same courses. So there is this sense of community and kind of involvement and commonality. That does allow you, as I'll talk a little bit about, to transfer between some of the programs we have at math in, in the Faculty of Mathematics at Waterloo. What does an undergrad degree look like? Well, you have to take 40 courses. And so typically students do eight academic terms where they take five courses per term. Sometimes students take more courses or less courses, but at the end, you do need a minimum of 40 courses to graduate, and at least 10 of them have to be non-math or non-CS courses. So by that, I mean you have to take 10 courses outside the Faculty of Mathematics. So that could be arts courses, whether that's social sciences or applied uh, or, or more kind of humanity. So that is, you could take history or psychology or sociology. You could take science courses like chemistry, physics, biology. You could take environment studies courses. You could take health courses. So those are courses that are open to you. In fact, you need to do at least 10 of those courses in order to get your undergrad degree. Let me talk a little bit about the four strong departments we have. All of these 
programs listed here, all of these majors give you a Bachelor of Mathematics degree, which is also a very unique degree in North America. Uh, most other students would get a Bachelor of Science, for example, or a Bachelor of Arts degree if they studied mathematics, computer science, or statistics. So let me talk a little bit about applied mathematics. So applied mathematics really is a way to model the world using kind of continuous functions. And by that, I mean the way that one might model the flow of water or the flow of electricity or how wind goes over top of a wing, for example, or around a car when it's driving. Those are all kind of problems that applied mathematics would be concerned about. And applied mathematics really has to do with differential equations and calculus. So if you like calculus and are interested in that, then think about doing applied mathematics, either as your major or as a minor or as some of your electives. So not surprisingly within applied mathematics, Sub areas include mathematical physics, biology, earth sciences, economics, physics, and scientific computation. All of those things try to model the real world in some way. Pure mathematics, you might think, well, maybe pure mathematics is exactly the opposite of applied. So really applied mathematics means calculus and pure mathematics, generally speaking, is more about the study of algebra. That is more coming up with axioms and rules and representations of things and models to understand how various structures work in a very algebraic sense. So within pure mathematics, we have the mathematical finance and math teaching options because those are tend to be more algebraically structured. Moving to the right column, we have combinatorics and optimization. This was one of my majors when I was an undergrad student. In fact, I did a master's in combinatorics and optimization as well. Combinatorics is the study of combinations of things. That is how many ways are there to arrange some objects in some pattern that you know, satisfies some kind of restraints or restrictions. So combinatorics is sometimes called discrete mathematics. Optimization is the study of how to optimize some kind of process based on other constraints. So for example, perhaps you have a factory and you produce some sort of thing, but you try to figure out, well, how many things can we make and how can we optimize this? And of course you have various um, constraints. That is, you know, the raw materials you take in, maybe the price of those raw materials, the human resources, that is how many workers you have and how often they can work. And you try to optimize to figure out where in these processes can we, you know, what, what is the most amount of money we can make or the most amount of widgets we can produce? So not surprisingly as well, within combinatorics and optimization, which we usually abbreviate as C and O, um, because combinatorics and optimization is a mouthful, that includes mathematical optimization, operations research, and business applications. Because, for example, looking at an organization, you, you might say, well, how can we optimize what it is this organization does? Finally, on the bottom right, we have statistics and actuarial science. So statistics is really a way of measuring or predicting the probability of some events happening, a way to model kind of chance and likelihood. And so that, not surprisingly, deals with data science and statistics for health. That is, you know, how likely is it that if you smoke, you will develop cancer? That is statistics. So you, you know, you take samples and you say, well, we've got this group of people that are in this group and other groups of people that satisfy this condition. We compare and we determine whether or not it's statistically significant that behavior A implies outcome B. Actuarial science is connected to statistics, but more of a uh, focused more directly on determining how to value insurance policies. That is, what should premiums be for, let's say, a late 40s you know, male who drives a Toyota Corolla? What should their you know, monthly insurance rate be? And why is that different than a 16-year-old male driving a Lamborghini, for example? Why should I pay less than a 16-year-old male? And so actuarial science looks, uses these statistical models to predict how likely are the accidents, what's the typical cost of such an accident, therefore what should we charge as the premium. And so actuarial science also deals with finance and predictive analysis. And actuarial science is one of our kind of larger majors, I would say, in the undergrad program. 
I talked about the fact that there is, an, is a school as well, the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science. David R. Cheriton was an alumnus, uh, is an alumnus, I should say, of the University of Waterloo. He's a professor at Stanford University in California. Um, and he also was one of the first investors in this tiny company called Google. And so he has done well financially and has given back some money to the School of Computer Science, and we have named the school after him. And so in computer science, we have three different degrees possible. The Bachelor of Computer Science, the Bachelor of Compu uh, Computing and Financial Management, which is the BCFM, which I'll call the CFM program. And we have the Bachelor of Business Administration and Bachelor of Computer Science double degree program. So we have the BBA BCS program. The BBA BCS program is the BCS program, but in addition, you're taking your electives in the business school at Wilfrid Laurier University, which is about a kilometer down the road on University Avenue. And so in fact, that program, you are getting two degrees. You will graduate both from Waterloo with the BCS, and you'll also graduate from Laurier with the Bachelor of Business Administration. So this is a kind of intense program in the sense that you have to take more than 40 courses to actually get your degrees, but you are getting two degrees at the same time. This beautiful colored chart with various columns and rows gives a very high level view about some of the programs and specializations that you can choose. So in particular, and really a kind of along the top are the kind of four main categories or really the three main categories that you apply to in the sense of if you're applying to through OUAC and you all will if you are applying to Waterloo Math, you can either apply for math which would give you all of the possibilities shown in those kind of first two left columns with the lighter pink highlighting. That is Axi, Applied Math, Biostats, so on. If you're interested in those programs, you should apply to math. Now, those majors, you can choose them after first year, but by after first year, I don't mean that you have to choose them after just eight months of school you can actually choose some of those majors later on in your program, in second, third, or even fourth year, so you can declare your major later. Some of those programs, in particular, actuarial science is one, data science is another, where you do, in fact, need to choose those majors right after first year and possibly apply for them. Okay, So, for example, AXI, if you want to get into AXI, you need to, make the, you need to meet the minimum requirement after your first year, and if you meet that minimum required in terms of your average, then you would be admitted to the program if you want. The second column in the slightly darker pink labels math, business, and accounting programs. These you apply to directly. So that is if you're interested in doing the math, BMath BBA double degree program, which is similar to the BCS BBA double degree program, that is two degrees except now the focus is not computer science, the focus is one of those math programs shown in the left, you could apply to that directly. If you'd like to do the single degree math business program, you would apply to that directly. We also have the math farm and the math CPA program. Math farm is financial analysis and risk management. And the math CPA program is the accounting program where you would be specialized and designated as a CPA once you've finished your exams in, in the CPA program after you graduate. Computer science, you apply to one of those four possibilities. That is, you can say, I would like to do computer science. So you apply to the BCS program. You can apply to the BCS double degree program. You can apply to the BCF, BCFM program, or you can apply to software engineering. Now, software engineering is sort of a funny math thing in that B, the software engineering program is in fact a joint program between the Faculty of Mathematics and the Faculty of Engineering. And so it is a math program and also not a math program at the same time. Uh, in terms of computer science specializations, there's a list of some of the specializations that you can do within computer science. You do not need to pick a specialization. So if you are interested in, for example, computational fine arts and like computer science, then of course you could pick that as your specialization if that interests you. Many students don't have a specialization in computer science and are doing just the BCS program. Okay? So those specializations are something that you can add but are not required to add. 
Let me talk a little bit about our co-op program. So Waterloo is world renowned for a co-op program for good reason. Our co-op program is larger than any other program in the country. In fact, it's larger than the sum of all the other co-op programs in the country. So we are orders of magnitude larger in terms of the number of employers that we interact with and the number of jobs that we find for our students, or in fact, that students find for themselves, but we kind of bring in those jobs for students to apply to. So that is, we have a huge number of students in our co-op program. So about 75% of math students are come into the program in co-op. And so that's roughly, you know, about 800 students every year are in the co-op program. Um, what do you do in the co-op program? So you go to school. So Waterloo is broken up really into three four-month chunks per year. So right now we are in what's called the fall academic term, which runs from September to December. Starting in January, that's the winter academic term, which which runs from January till the end of April. And then we have the spring term, which goes from May till August. So in fact, there are students on campus year round. The co-op program for the fall 2023 students would work like this. You would come to school for four months from September, 2023 till December. Then you'd also come to school from January, 2024 till April, 2024. And then in May, 24, you'd start your first work term. And from that point onward, you would do work, school, work, school, work, school in four month chunks. So you're alternating work terms and school terms. This does extend your degree in the sense that it takes one year longer than a typical undergraduate student. However, by the time you graduate, you will have done six work terms and six work terms, which are four months each is 24 months, which divided by 12 is two years. So you will have two years of work experience. One of the best things that you can have in, in your co-op experience is a job you love. That is, you have the opportunity to try six different jobs and say, do I like this as my career? The second best thing that can happen on a work term is you find a job that you hate. And the nice thing about that is that you only have to do it for four months. And you realize Oh, I do not like to work in industry X. I don't want to work for a big company or I don't want to work for a small company or I don't want to work in this city. Uh, you know, you can try out a variety of experiences and realize mm, I don't really like that, for example. You have six opportunities. I encourage students to do a few different positions in various ways. That is, look at large versus small. Look at big city versus smaller city. Look at, you know, Toronto versus Vancouver versus the U.S. versus overseas, if you can. So try different possibilities while you're an undergrad. Another reason why students and parents really like the co-op program is because it really helps finance your education. That is, in your work terms, you are getting paid. And if you're curious how much you're getting paid, you can Google you Waterloo Math Co-op Salaries. And you'll find the range of the hourly wage that students earn in various work terms. And you can see that as they progress through from their first work term to their sixth work term, that the average salary goes up over that time. And so that money you can use to help pay for your next academic term. So in fact, it breaks up after first year. That's the only time that you're going to be in school for eight months consecutively. After that, you will do at least four months of work before you have to pay for your next term of tuition. And then you have another four months of work. So you really can kind of spread out how you are paying for university and earn money in between those times that you need to pay for it. One other really nice thing about the co-op program is that you get to experience six possibly different employers or different cities or different experiences, but also your classmates will also have jobs and they can give you feedback or connect you with their employers to say, oh yeah, my friend Troy, he really enjoyed working at this company. Maybe I should talk to Troy to figure out, you know, is there a spot for me or who sh I should talk to? So you'll have all of these connections that will help you find a career that is interesting to you. Now, not every student needs to do co-op or wants to do co-op. So about 25% of our undergrads don't do co-op. Some programs you are required to do co-op. For example, for example, 
uh, software engineering, uh, the double degree programs, the math CPA programs, those are all co-op programs. So that is, you do need to do co-op in those. Other programs are co-op or regular. And so 25% of our students are what we call regular, meaning they go to school for eight months at a time, and then they do not go to school from May till August. So kind of modeling typically what many students around the world do in terms of their university undergraduate education. Of course, this takes really three and two year two-thirds year to compete to complete. That is, you're going to start in September, but finish in April, uh, three and two-thirds years later. Of course, those work terms that you have, you're going to have three, you know, kind of summer or spring terms that you're not at university, and you can work, you know, and get one year's work experience there. Why should you do regular? Well, perhaps you have a family business that you need to be helping out with in the springtime between May and August. Maybe you work at a summer camp, and so that only runs during the summer. Maybe your family always, you know, goes overseas and visits relatives in a country somewhere outside of Canada, or maybe they go somewhere else in, in Canada, and you have these kind of summer commitments. If you have those sorts of commitments, then the regular program is probably something that you should look into rather than the co-op program, where you may be at school, for example, in the summer in some years. Certainly, because you graduate sooner, you could enter the workforce sooner. And perhaps some of you know already, yes, I want to do a master's degree or I want to be a professor. And so I decide I want to do my PhD. Well, you might want to start to work towards that faster and you can graduate sooner under the regular program and therefore start your master's possibly sooner. Many students ask, what do I need to get in? What is required for admissions? And the short answer is, I don't know what grades you will need to get in because I don't have your grades yet. Once I have the grades and the number of applicants and the exact number of spots that we will admit into, then I'll know what the cutoffs are. So that is what we did for fall 2022 is probably going to be similar for fall 23, but not necessarily exactly the same because it's a different set of students that are applying. Maybe there's going to be more students, maybe there'll be less, maybe averages will be higher. It's hard to know at this point. But historically, averages have been high 80s to mid 90s, depending on the program. Certainly, some of our more competitive programs, like computer science, like CFM, like double degree, like farm, those averages tend to be in the higher range because they are more competitive. And by competitive, I just mean we have more applicants applying for those programs, right? it, relatively, like more applicants per position. It is the case that admission to co-op is slightly more competitive than admission to regular, though not substantially. So don't let that be a factor. If you would like to do co-op, you should apply to co-op. Okay? If you know you do not want co-op, then apply to regular. And if you're not sure, my advice is think about applying to co-op. In addition to the grades that are required, we also look at the admission information form, the AIF. And that AIF is a fundamental part of your application. If you do not fill in the AIF, you will not be admitted. So in fact, we do have students applying with high 90s as their average, but they forget to, or do not in any way, fill out the AIF. Those students don't get offers, even though they have tremendously high averages. So it is required. You need to fill out the AIF. The AIF, you're going to tell us about your academic history. You're going to tell us why you're choosing Waterloo. And you're going to tell us about your extracurricular activities. That is, what, so I know what you do when you're inside the classroom because I have your grades. I'll know how you did in English. And I know how you did in advanced functions. And I'll know how you did in calculus. I want to know what do you do when you're not in the classroom? That is, what do you do at school? What clubs? What sports? What activities? Are you in drama? Are you in the musical? Are you in band? Tell me about what you do inside of school. Tell me also what you do in your community. Do you volunteer at a soup kitchen periodically? Are you involved? Do you visit people in retirement homes? Are you involved in your church or your synagogue or your mosque? Tell me about those activities. Tell me about any kind of self-study or projects you're working on, or if you have a part-time job. 
tell me about any of the math or computing competitions that you wrote or involvement in any sort of other competitions, maybe robotics or DECA or debate teams. Tell me if you're tutoring students, you know, as part of your part-time job or just as a volunteer basis. Tell me how you fill your time. So I want to see how you, I want you to demonstrate to me how you manage your time well, how you balance kind of various priorities, how you're using your time and energy to kind of make the world a better place uh, for everyone, not just for yourself. Those are, I'm looking for leadership. So are you the captain of your swim team? Are you, you know, are you the president? Are you involved in student government? Uh, do you, are you a community activist? Are you involved in various organizations, kind of, you know, political or community organizations for various causes? Tell me what you do with your time. How do you fill out the AIF? It's an online form that'll become available to you once you apply. So in your kind of acknowledgement email that you'll get once you apply, it'll say, you know, set up your Quest account and fill in the AIF through your Quest account. Okay, so that'll be, you know, within hours or days after you actually applied. When do we make admission decisions? Well, the vast majority of our offers are made in mid-May. Why do we make them so late? Because we have so many students applying and we want to get the most information we can. By mid-May, we will have all of your first semester final grades from grade 12, and we'll also have your midterm grades from your second semester. So in fact, we will have a pretty clear picture of how you have done and are doing in your grade 12 year. When we make admissions decisions, we base them on your admissions averages and your AIF score. Now, what do I mean by admissions averages? Well, certainly we're going to take your required courses, the two math courses and English, that is calculus and vectors, advanced functions and English, and your three other grade 12 courses, one of, mid, one of which must be a 4U, and two of which must be a 4U or 4M. So this is kind of the Waterloo, the Ontario model, I should say. If you are studying somewhere outside of Ontario, we have equivalencies. So that is, of course, you're going to need English, and you're going to need math, but you may not actually have those two math courses that Ontario offers. We will count your math course, for example, your math IB, we will use that in both to, to satisfy both math courses. Okay? So if you are in a different system of study and have questions, again, ask our team exactly what it is that are required or check our website resources. We look at your grades and I, in fact, when I look at your averages, I will look at those kind of top six, including those three required. I will also look at the top three, those three required as its own average. So that is, I will take the average of your two math courses in English. I will also take the average of just your two math courses. And I'll look at those averages and that will help me make admissions decisions. The AIF is read and scored and we give a number for that AIF and we combine that AIF score with your admission average to calculate what in fact your total admission score is. Now, do you need to write contests to get into math? No. Every year we admit many, many students who have never written a math contest. Why? Because they had an excellent average and an excellent AIF. And that is kind of our first cutoff. So that is, I have a huge pool of students. I will draw a line and admit all of the students above a certain line that have an average and an AIF score above a certain threshold, regardless of whether or not they have written a contest. Now, below that line, now I need to start to make tougher decisions. In fact, since we have so many applicants, we do have some students below that line, but many, many ties. That is, many students who have the same admission averages and the same AIF scores. And so when I look at that, then I will start to say, well, let's look at just their math average. Who has the highest, you know, just math average? Who has a really strong AIF? Who has an outstanding AIF? That is, who's really involved in their community and in student government and teams and music and, you know, have a part-time job. And those students will get offers of admission. I will also, at that point, use contests as a tiebreaker if I have many students with the same average and same AIF score. 
So a student that gets 87 on the Euclid and is tied with a bunch of other students who did not write the Euclid at all will probably get an offer of admission. So that is, it can only help. So do think about writing the Euclid and or the CSMC, okay? Because it can only help. It's not required, but doing well may increase your chances if you happen to be below that threshold where I make my first cut. Some students ask, well, what if I repeat courses? Don't repeat required courses. What if I take courses outside my regular day school? Don't take required courses outside your regular day school. Doing so may jeopardize their admissibility to the Faculty of Mathematics. So that is, I want you to take your grade 12 courses once and do well in them. And I want you to take them through your regular day school. If you want to know more about those kind of admission kind of rules and, and what course equivalents are, the website there, urlu.ca slash math slash future undergraduates has all kinds of information that'll be helpful. As I mentioned, the, the, with those kind of high cutoffs in the high 80s to mid 90s in terms of averages, why is that the case? Because we have a very strong group of students applying for our programs. Last year, for example, we had over 18,000 applications for relatively few spots, 1,250 spots. So that means it's something on a factor of like 15 to one, roughly, you know, somewhere between like 12 to 15, depending on the program. That doesn't mean I admit every 12th person or every 15th person. I'm not counting one, two, three, four, oh, 11, 10, 12, you're in. No, we look at all of the applicants and we end up making enough offers to fill 1,250 spots, roughly speaking. What does this mean for you? It means that you should still apply. Just because it's competitive doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. I can guarantee that if you do not apply, you will not get in. So what you should also do though, is make backup plans. Do not apply, for example, just to Waterloo CS. And that'd be your only application through OUAC and say, well, if I don't get Waterloo CS, I'm not gonna do any university. That is a bad decision. You should make backup plans so that if you don't get into Waterloo Computer Science, for instance, you get into some other programs that are good and are useful and are practical and you will have a good undergraduate career wherever you go and you'll learn lots of things. Just make sure that you have those backup plans. OUAC allows you to have three choices. You can augment those choices by paying additional fees. Some students make four or five or six total undergrad selection choices. I encourage you to make good backup plans that you apply to schools that you would be happy going to. Do we make alternate offers? Well, yes and no. Here is what you should not do. Do not apply for the math double degree program, the BBA, BC, or BBA, BMath program, for instance, and also apply for the BMath program. That is, don't waste two spots on those programs because if you apply, for example, to the BMath, BBA program, and you don't meet the threshold for admission, you will automatically be considered for the BMath single degree business program. If you don't make the cutoff for that program, you'll be considered for the BMath program. And so don't use two spots because in fact, we will make alternate offers to you if you don't kind of meet the threshold to one. Now, we do suggest that if you would like to apply to an honors math program and an honors computer science program, you do apply to both programs. Some years we have made alternate offers from computer science to mathematics, but some years we have not. So that is, do, we're not guaranteeing that just because you applied to CS that you will be automatically considered for math. If you would like to apply to honors mathematics, you should apply to honors mathematics in order to be considered. Okay? And you should apply to honors mathematics if you would be happy doing an honors mathematics undergraduate degree. That is, do not assume that you can transfer into computer science. There are some students, very, very few spots that are open in computer science after first year, but 
that is even more competitive than getting into our undergraduate programs. So that is, there are very few spots that open up in computer science for non-CS math students to transfer into. So you should go into honors mathematics if you would be happy getting an honors mathematics undergraduate degree. I mentioned a little bit about the contests that are run. Here are a couple of contests that are run through the Center, through the center for Education, Mathematics, Computing, and Meg will mention a few things about the CMC at the end of the talk. The two contests that I mentioned earlier are the CSMC and the Euclid, the Canadian Senior Mathematics Contest. The CSMC is written in mid-November. Uh, if you're inside North or South America, that's on the 16th of November, so just over, well, just exactly two weeks from today, I think, yes. And if you're outside North or South America, that's November 17th. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, it is not required for admission. You can be admitted without writing any math contest. As I also said, it is strongly recommended. Now, some scholarships, I, we require your results on either the CSMC or the Euclid. So again, writing the contest can be beneficial for scholarships. How do you do well on the CSMC and how do you do well on the Euclid? Well, you prepare. That is, don't let the CSMC that you write in two weeks be the first CMC you have ever looked at. The URL listed at the bottom there, highlighted in pink, gives you a way to prepare for these contests. That is, practice. Have a look at the last few years of contests, do them, and look at the solutions to understand how they were meant to be done. The Euclid contest is written in the early spring, that is November 4th or 5th, depending on where you are in the world. And again, the same things are true of the Euclid as the CSMC. It's not required for admission. We strongly recommend it. It is required for some scholarships and you should prepare. We also run this thing called the Canadian Computing Competition, which I am a kind of lead of. Uh, the computing, the CCC, the Canadian Computing Competition, is really a, a computer science contest where students have to write five different programs to solve five different problems within a three hour window. So that is the writing programs, which read some input and produce some output that answers the question that that the input specifies. Mm -hmm. You do not need to write the CCC, but many students do enjoy writing it. Uh, it is written in mid-February. And in fact, one of the benefits of writing the CCC, in addition to kind of challenging yourself in terms of writing these computer programs, is that doing well on the senior level competition, if you do well there, you'll be invited to the Canadian Computing Olympiad in May. And if you do well at the CCO, you'll be invited to be on the Canadian IOI team and travel with me somewhere in the world. Next year will be Hungary, which is hosting the IOI, the International Olympiad of Informatics, where you would represent Canada and compete against about 82 other countries in the world. I mentioned a little bit about scholarships. So here is a kind of math specific scholarship uh, listing. There are other scholarships that are available to math students that are not listed here. There's other scholarships available to any UW applicant that are not listed here. So you should check out the scholarships page if you're interested. But I want to highlight these here because these are math specific. Some of these you do need to apply to and others you do not. So you'll notice the first three and the bottom two in this list they have a little star beside them. Those are scholarships that you would need to apply to. And the application deadline for those is mid-February. That is February 17th. The scholarship application form will be up in a couple of weeks. It's all done online and you fill it out and submit it. Notice that our scholarships range from $25,000 spread out over four years. Uh, we also have some $40,000 and $20,000 scholarships designated for students who are studying in India. Um, we also have other kind of smaller, smaller scholarships that are available. Okay. Um, what's the difference between a national and a global? Well, a national scholarship, those are for students who are Canadian citizens or permanent residents of Canada. The global scholarships are for students who would be studying at Waterloo on a study visa or a study permit okay, that are not Canadian citizens or permanent residents. Okay. 
Okay? But the application is the same for the national, the global, and the India scholarship. So it's just one application form. To tie back to the beginning where I talked about why you should do mathematics, I mentioned a few things about careers and that math has kind of dynamic and interesting and expanding career potential. CareerCast, which is a website that kind of deals with jobs and careers and interviews and that kind of keeping track of the kind of employment landscape around North America, in, a, in connection to the Wall Street Journal, it ranks you know, I think the top 300 jobs. And the bottom jobs are jobs that really are not great in the sense that there's a high risk of injury or death, poorly paid, poor working conditions, job prospects are not good. At the top of the list are jobs which are exactly the opposite, high paying, in demand, low risk, growing potential. And you'll notice in 2021, for instance, of the top 10 jobs, eight of them are highlighted in pink. And those jobs are jobs that are directly related to mathematics, computer science, or statistics. That says that the best jobs in the world are connected to math, computer science, and, and statistics. Okay. What are some jobs that our undergrads or our alumni are currently doing? Here is a very, very, very small list. So you can take mathematics and computer science and statistics mm -hmm. and use it for a whole bunch of things. Okay? Some of these might not even seem like, oh, that doesn't sound like a math career, like an epidemiologist, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, it is. Or meteorologists, what? They just kind of predict the weather. The way that you model weather is by using differential equations and time stamps and maps and things like that that are all information. So here's a very small smattering of these sorts of jobs. All right, what should you do next? Well, I think you should write the math contest. So in two weeks, the CSMC is being written. I would strongly encourage you to think about writing that contest. If not, then certainly write the Euclid contest in April, if you can. Make sure that you apply before the deadline of February 1st. I cannot admit you if you do not apply on time. Every year I have students saying, oh, I missed the deadline for application. It's February 3rd. I totally forgot. I say, yes, you did. I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do. We close the application deadline on February 1st. No exceptions. So make sure you apply before then. Apply well before then. If you know you would like to apply to Waterloo Mathematics or Computer Science, apply today. Get it in there, and you can always change your choices and rearrange them through, through OUAC, but at least get it into the system. Once you've done that, then by the 17th of February next year, you should have fi finished filling out your AIF and any scholarship application. And I encourage you to, certainly you need to do the AIF, and I encourage you to think about applying for scholarships if you think you kind of meet the criteria and take the time to fill out the application. And finally, you should really work hard to finish grade 12 with strong grades. Many students slack off in their last half of their grade 12 semester. They have a great grade 12 year. They have a very difficult first four weeks of term when they come in September because they realize, oh, I was sort of taught this, but I don't remember it. We assume that you understand everything you were taught in high school, and we will perhaps do 30 minutes of review at the start of term. And we will summarize all of your grade 12 work in 30 minutes, and then we'll move onwards from that. So you better be sure that you have all of your grade 12 material really solidly understood. Today is not the only opportunity for you to ask us questions. So if in two hours from now, or in two days, or two weeks, or two months, you realize, oh, I have this question, do feel free to reach out by either checking our website to connect with our team, you can book a one-on-one -on -one appointment to ask particular questions of Meg and her team in terms of 
oh, I'm studying in this school system in this country. And so what are my equivalent courses and what do I need to do? And when do I submit things and how do I get? Feel free to ask us any of those questions, either by booking a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Meg or one person from our team, or by sending an email through mathinfo at urlu.ca. Again, the same team that is answering questions in the Q&A session or the Q&A kind of tab today, those will be the people that deal with the math info requests. So again, if there's anything that you're uncertain about or you want clarification, please do reach out and we'll do our best to answer. If you want to follow us on social media, there's us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And thank you all for taking the time to join me and the rest of the team today. Thank you, Troy. That was a lot of valuable information. And I'm already seeing some chatter in the chat uh, with many thanks to you. Um, I know the students learned a lot. So we have about six minutes for questions. So Troy, we'll maybe try and rapid fire okay. through some of these if we can. Uh, yes, um, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I thought this was a really good question. What would be a great supplement additional courses to pair with computer science that you would recommend to someone who is planning uh, to apply to computer science? Oh, okay. So in terms of, I, I'm going to answer kind of two different questions, I think. So what would you take in high school? The answer is it's totally up to you. You should take something that you're interested in. Um, we don't really care in the sense of what your other three grade 12 courses are other than the required. So whether you take geography or chemistry, it doesn't really matter to us you should take something that you're interested in. So in particular, I mean, with computer science, there are tons of potential applications. In fact, computer science is used in geography and it's also used in physics. So, you know, you can really kind of tailor any non-computer science course to understand how there is computer science involved with it. In terms of your undergraduate career then as well, the electives you take, really you should take something that you're interested in. So. Perhaps you really like physics or chemistry, and so that could be your kind of first elective in your first term. Maybe you like psychology. And so take something that you find interesting, and in fact, if you find it interesting, you may in fact find ways to integrate or weave in computer science into that. So I, would, I don't have a recommendation of what it is. Computer science is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Mathematics is everywhere. So even in history, you know, we worry about carbon dating for example. And how does that happen? Well, there's some kind of mathematical analysis about how old this carbon-14 and therefore how old this historical document is. So there's math and computer science sort of being applied even in history. So I would say take something that you're interested first and foremost, and you will find connections to math and computer science in there. Okay, great. And this is sort of the opposite question, uh, but I found it interesting. There's a math perspective student on the call who asks, is CS a big part of the math curriculum? I'm not particularly interested in CS, but I love math and want to do math. Okay. So I think they're realizing sort of, they wanna know how much CS they would have to do as a, as a BMath. Right, very good question. So uh, the BMath program, as I think I mentioned, in your first academic term, you take calculus, algebra, computer science, communications, and one elective. In your second academic term, you take calculus, algebra, computer science, a communications course, and one elective. Those are the only times you need to take computer science to get a BMath degree. So that is, you need two CS courses to get your BMath degree. So, and those courses for BMath students, we have kind of three flavors of CS courses. We have the advanced CS, we have CS 135, and we have CS 115. And CS-135 is designed for CS majors. CS-115 is designed for not CS majors. So they cover similar material. CS-115 has kind of less material than CS-135. So yes, you would need to do some CS, but you're doing two courses out of the set of 40 courses that you need yeah. to take that are CS. Yeah, two out of 40. So not, not too much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, this one I, this one came in a couple times. How differently is the AIF weighted compared to grades? So maybe you just wanna talk about sort of holistically. Sure. So, I mean, for some competitive programs where I have a very high cutoff, for example, in computer science, in some senses, the AIF is kind of 
in some senses has sort of more weight in the sense that, you know, if the average, if I'm looking at students who all have, you know, 92 and above, for instance, there are only eight integers between 92 and 100. And so that's a really compressed scale there. So what's going to differentiate those students is the AF. So in terms of the weighting, I mean, the more competitive the program, the more important the AIF is. Um, in some senses, do well on the AF. That is, show me that you are involved in your community, in your school. Think about how you manage your time. Show me how you've taken on leadership responsibilities. Show me how you do good. That's really what it's about. So, I mean, the waiting is sort of what the waiting is. There's not much you can do about that other than do the best you can in your courses and on the AIF. And I think the last question here I'll ask, there was a lot of good engagement when you were speaking about the CEMC contests. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you covered how they're not mandatory for admission, but there was a few questions that came in asking, what is a good contest score? So maybe you could highlight for the CSMC and the Euclid um, sort of averages and, and what we would consider a, a stronger score. Yeah, so typically the Euclid, just thinking of the Euclid last year, for example, and, and you can find these, these kind of statistics on the CMC website in terms of contest results. We kind of publish, you know, how many students wrote and what the averages were. I think for the Euclid, getting a score above 50 was an above average score. So, you know, that would be a good score. The higher you do, the more good the score is. If a student got 80 or above on a Euclid, test or a Euclid contest, I would view that as a very, very good score. Um, and really eight out of 10 is solving, you know, the first eight questions. Questions nine and 10 on the Euclid typically are more interesting and have kind of subtleties and interesting twists. Um, but I think, I think an under, I think a grade 12 student should easily be able to get to the first four or five questions. And that would be average. And then you know, ideally getting questions five, six, and seven, um, and even question eight, that would be, you know, a very good score. That's great. Thank you, Troy. We're at uh, 9.31 here, so we've promised to stick within the hour. Thank you so much for all the information you shared. I know the students uh, on the call today appreciate all the insight and advice you're able to give. Um, for those of you that were looking at the registrations this week for other virtual events, I just wanted to promote uh, Professor Ian Vanderberg uh, tomorrow, so November 3rd at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then again the same session at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, is going to essentially do a math problem solving workshop for those of you that are interested uh, in writing the CSMC or the Euclid this year. Um, so bring your paper, bring your pencil. That one's gonna be all about solving math problems and engaging in a different way. Uh, Troy, thank you again. And, and for those of you on the call, if you have questions remaining, I know we had about almost 90 questions come through the chat. Um, as Troy mentioned before, there's many ways to get in touch with our recruitment team. Uh, you can see our email there on the screen, mathinfo at uwaterloo.ca. You can book a one-on-one -on -one with uh, one of the recruiters. If you wanna go through a list of questions, we are here to help and support you uh, through your university journey or your university search. Uh, so thanks again for tuning in. I would encourage you to join us on November 3rd for those workshops. Uh, and Troy, thank you for all the advice for the prospect prospective students. Yeah. Um, and fall open house if they are nearby. Yes, yes, thank you. All so right. if you are within uh, driving distance this Saturday, uh, we are having an in-person event, our fall open house. So this is a great opportunity. If you're able to make it to campus, you can see our facilities, you can chat with professors and staff, current students, take tours, um, and just really get a feel for what Waterloo campus is like. So if you're if you're close by and you're able to make it, uh, please join us. I believe it's 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and the whole campus is open for visitors. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.